Amen. Good morning. I know it's a little bit out of the ordinary to have two readings for our scripture this morning. But if you'll notice the two comparisons, they're, well, they're very powerful. When we think about what we've been focusing on in Ephesians chapter 1, we've, we've been looking at the resources we have in Christ. That they're stronger than anything that the world has to offer. And the reason that this is important, that we discuss these resources, is it's easy to fall away. It's easy to lose sight of what is the most important thing, and we, we give up, we let go, and we fall by the wayside. But one strong resource that we have, we find the same, the same exact thing that one of the prodigal son found. One of the sons, I say. Oftentimes we call Luke 15 the parable of the prodigal son. I don't call it the parable of the prodigal son. I call it the parable of the two sons. And in fact, if you'll notice, there is the response of the youngest. You have the youngest son and how he takes the inheritance from his father. And then we're going to discuss that this morning. But tonight, we're going to look at the second son and the response that he gives to his brother coming back. So I want to encourage you to come back tonight to discuss this full parable in its context. But as we've looked at Ephesians chapter 1, notice it says, In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of His will. So the will of God is that we have an inheritance. And one of the strongest resources that we have in Christ is an inheritance. And so that gets us to our context this morning in Luke chapter 15. If you'll turn there with me. Notice the fact that he comes to his father and he's looking for his inheritance. Well, that's, that's something that's a resource for you and I, but notice his focus is something that is physical. The inheritance that we have in Christ is spiritual. It is salvation. It's heaven. And it's something that our father has given to us by his will. He has predetermined that to take place for the church. For those of us in it. So we're going to look at this concept of the inheritance and see that he's looking for his inheritance now. He's looking for heaven on earth, if you will. And so because of this, we're going to see some actions of this prodigal son. We're going to, I believe, learn from him. In the first place, we find rebellion. We find rebellion in Luke 15, verse 11. If you'll turn there, it says, And he said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. So I think it's important, we're going to be looking tonight more at the context of who is being talked to. These are the Jews they would, have understand, they would have understood the concept of property being an inheritance more than you and I understand it today. If you receive property as an inheritance, it just so happens that, that someone had property that they gave to you. But think about the, the children of Israel. The promised land was meant that every single person had property and it was gifted to their family. And so that meant that you would have property that would come to you, but it was something that the, the most wealthy all the way to the poorest would receive this property. And it's something to remain within the family when your relative passes away. That's key. Notice he comes to his father and he's saying, give me my portion now. Well, what is his portion Notice this, the fact that he's asking for it now. It's, he's saying, Father, I wish you were dead. He's saying, I, you might as well be dead to me. I want what is coming to me when you die, but I want it now. It shows rebellion. But what portion is he asking for? Is he asking for a gift? No, this is not a gift. This is something under the law that he would have been, he would have been given. Uh, if you will, turn to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 
We're going to look at chapter 21. Almost, almost said chapter 17. Chapter 21, and really verse 17 is where we're going to, to look, but I want us to look at verses 15 through 17. It says, If a man has two wives, the one loved and the other unloved, and both the loved and the unloved have borne him children, and if the firstborn son belongs to the unloved, you almost get a picture of Jacob with Rachel and Leah, and then through Leah he had his oldest son, Reuben, but then his most beloved son was his first through Rachel, Joseph. But Joseph was not the oldest. So you see this picture that under the law, there is a way to handle this. Look at verse 16. Then on the day when he, the father, assigns his possessions as an inheritance to his sons, he may not treat the son of the loved as the firstborn. So in this case, Jacob could not give Joseph that special treatment for his inheritance. But he shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the firstfruits of his strength, the right of the firstborn is his. So the firstborn would receive a double portion. So it's important to recognize as we get to our context in Luke 15, in verse 11, this is the youngest son of two brothers. So that means his brother gets two-thirds of the property, and he is to receive one-third of his father's property. That's a lot to ask of his father. And what he's saying is, he's saying, I want my property now, and we're going to see what he does with it. He takes that portion, and he goes to a distant land away from it. So he's going as far away from his father as he can from his property. So what did he do? He sold his property. Something that should not have been done in Israel. Shows that he completely cared less about the Father in heaven. And we're going to see those comparisons to this parable. And it's so similar to how it could take place in life. That some have said this is possibly, the audience possibly knows someone who's done this. This is not far-fetched, if you will. In Luke, back here in Luke chapter 15. He says this, Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had. That shows that he had sold this portion, and this shows the rebellion was complete. But you think about it, what did the father allow? He divided his property between them. The father didn't have to do that. In fact, back in Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verse 18, it's amazing, 18 through 21 actually gives us the bigger picture. If a son is rebellious, what, what should he have coming to him? If a man, see, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son, verse 18, who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother... And though they discipline him, will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city at the gate of the place where he lives. And they shall say to the elders of this city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He's a glutton and a drunkard. Does this sound familiar? Verse 21. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall purge the evil from your midst and all Israel shall hear and fear. Is it a coincidence that Moses gives us the rights to the firstborn as an inheritance, and then you see a son that is stubborn and rebellious, and that's what is coming to him? So when he says to his father, give me what's coming to me, we understand that under the law, him being rebellious in this way, he could be taken before the council and killed for his rebellion. So the fact that his father allows him to have his portion early, which was not done, which was disrespect to his father and his brother, shows incredible mercy on the part of the father. And it also shows an example that the father and our father in heaven has done for you and for me. If you will look at Genesis chapter 2, I have verse 9 there, but I like to look at verse 8. It says, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. 
The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we see what God has actually given us is some property at the very beginning. And it was this beautiful garden. It was this picture of heaven on earth. We understand that they could eat of the tree of life, but they couldn't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So this shows that God gave them a choice whether they wanted to experience life in the property that the Father gave them or experience death by eating of the fruit that they shouldn't eat. God allowed Adam and Eve to be rebellious. Just like the father here in Luke 15 allowed his youngest son to be rebellious. He gave him that choice. But think about what he was choosing. Well, Adam and Eve, what were they choosing? At the end of chapter 3, we understand that they were, they were kicked out of the garden, away from the presence of the Lord, and they would experience the consequences of sin, and that is death. So this young man was given the opportunity, the responsibility of his portion, the third of his father's estate. Look at verse 13 again in Luke 15. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. Some versions say riotous living or prodigal living. That's why we call him the prodigal son. He's wasteful. He wasted what he had coming to him because of his rebellion. So he lived it up. He had an, an amazing time with that, uh, with that property for a short period of time. And then what happened? Verse 14, it says, And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. Well, those he was living with during that time when he's spending everything are nowhere to be found because he's still in need. Nobody's there to help him. And we're going to see that here in just a moment. So we're going to start seeing that because of his rebellion, it's led to something else. And that's humiliation. He's humiliated because of verse 15. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. This is a far country away from the promised land. So this is, this is not a person of the tri tribe of Israel. And we know that because of, look at the job description. Who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. No Jew would own pigs. Because they're the most unclean animal within the law. And so there is no Jew that would be able to, would even be caught dead near one of these pigs. This is how desperate, how much in need he is. So he sent, so he went and hired himself out. So this, notice he was trying to get away from any, from, from this very thing, work. To be able to get away from his father and in the property, that meant he could just take that wealth and he could just live it up, and he didn't have to work. Well, now he had to work. So he's experiencing shame. He's experiencing the humiliation of this. So notice it says, verse 16, And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. So the second thing is, he experienced hunger, humiliation. And to add to that pang of humiliation, he had the pangs of hunger to... To top it all off, you ever been so hungry that your, your, your stomach is sitting there and it is churning and churning? You know, I, it's funny, we were, we were at a little ball game yesterday for our son. He's just, uh, our oldest has started flag football. And our five-year-old was sitting there and he says, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. He just had breakfast. I'm going, son, you're not hungry. Yes, I'm hungry. We don't, and as our society, we don't even, we don't comprehend this concept of hunger. We don't comprehend this to where he would literally throw all caution to the wind and notice what he's longing, he's longing to be fed with the food of the pigs ate. Now, I know I, I've mentioned this before, but growing up, my, you know, my dad has preached my whole life. And, and I remember when he was preaching in Tennessee, we lived in the preacher's house, which was across the street from a pig pen. It was a pig farm. One of the elders owned the pig farm. And, and so I remember the smell of that pig farm. I remember just, 
where the pigs were, their, their pen was completely mud. I remember it was just clay. It was just, they sat there because, you know, a pig, a pig cannot sweat. If the sun were to, to, to bake them, they become bacon prematurely. And, and so they would die. They have to have something in order for, for them to, to cool down. And so they wallow in the mire. For a pig, it's heaven. But for a human being, it is the most disgusting smell there is. I remember going over there and literally watching them slop the hogs. I remember watching just, just, just the, the big star bag full of just nasty food that they would just throw in there. And the food alone stunk. And they sit there, they would just sit there and eat it up and just have a blast with this food. And I'm sitting there, how are they eating this? And how are we eating it once they take it to the butcher? But you look at it, well, they, they can take that garbage and make a beautiful tasting bacon. But anyway, you, you look at the, the, the concept of this and you think, man, this is disgusting. And this is where he is. Because he made his bed and now he's lying in it and that bed is in a mire. It is in disgusting situation. Verse 16, And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. So he has experienced this hunger and now he's experiencing heartlessness. The world is not going to take care of you. The world is not going to take care of me. And we think that we, we live in a time now where, where we have a right to be taken care of by our society. Well, nothing's free. We, we don't have a right to be taken care of. There is no program for this man. Nobody cares for him. Now the fourth and final thing that he experiences is homeless, uh, homesickness. No, notice verse 17, it says, But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants." You ever been at that point where you're, you're, you're thinking about something that you know you need to do and you just start daydreaming about what the scenario is going to look like? That's what he's doing here. The, what he's saying is just real repentance. You, you see it in his mind. He's saying, he's saying my, my father's servants have it better than me. They're not having to slop hogs. They're, they're not having to actually longing to eat the nasty food that they eat. And I'm no longer worthy. You know, I'm one of his sons, but I'm not even worthy to be called his son. He's just telling, he's going over in his mind the, what he's going to say to his father. And it is a beautiful picture of repentance. But he's still in the mire. He is still surrounded by the pigs. That's not repentance. He's still in the state of rebellion. He's in a state of despair at this point. This is what he's willing to do. But how often do we know the right thing to do and yet we continue to wallow in the mire? That's James 4, 17. To him who knows to do good, that's what he knows. I know I need to go home. I know I need to go through this monologue and tell my father this. But you know what? It's just too hard. You know what? He's not going to accept me. You know what? I've, I have burned that bridge. It's just I'm never going to be able to go back. By the way, that's why tonight is so important for our, for our discussion. To complete the concept of this parable as we look at the second son. But notice, he could have just sat there and rolled over right, just like the pigs were doing. And died in his pride. But he was willing to swallow the very last thing that he had on his plate. And that was his pride. That led us to the second point, his repentance. He had godly sorrow, yes, but it didn't lead to repentance until, look at verse uh, 20. And he arose and came to his father. You know, just a very, very quick read. 
Something that just maybe we could just pass by and just keep going, but maybe we would miss the power in this passage. He arose, he got up, and came to his father. He had to come to himself before he could come to his father. And how many times do, do we sit there and we experience the pain and the turmoil of sin that we choose for ourselves and yet we choose not to do anything about it because we don't think we're worthy or we don't think that anyone will forgive us or we just don't think we're, again, good enough. He sees that he's, will he's willing to make this right. And he gets up and he goes to his father. And he says, and I, look, look at verse 20. He rose and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The father feels four things. We already saw the four things that the son feels because of his choice. But look at the four things that the father feels. He felt compassion. He felt his he, his heart went out to him, but then his legs followed suit, and he ran. This is most likely an older gentleman. During, the, during this time, it would, have been, uh, it would have been a disgrace for an older, uh, what I've read, that for an elderly person to run. Undignified, if you will. He, he threw all caution literally to the wind that he left behind him as he ran because of the compassion that he felt in his heart. And then he embraced him. He embraced him. He hugged him. And he kissed him. You don't see this, this maybe like a, you, when we think about a greeting in, in France, they'll kiss the cheek, you know, either side. This is not that picture of that kind of a greeting. This is falling on his son, embracing him, and kissing him all over. I, he's like, why? Look, look at what he says. Let's see. The, the, the son says, verse 21, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I want us to look at, look at the context there. When did the son say this? Did the father, and when did the father show compassion, run, embrace, and kiss? Was it after the son made this statement? Did he, did he have his arms folded and just wait for his son to say this? And the moment he did, that's when he put, he put his arms around him. That's when he showed compassion. No, the moment he sees him afar off, he sees him and has compassion. He runs, he hugs, and he kisses. Then the son makes this statement. He shows repentance by coming back to the Father. May we recognize repentance when we see it walking through those doors, returning back to be in the fold. I think sometimes we see that repentance is, is here. But the moment someone comes through those doors, we have no idea what kind of a mire they've been in. We have no idea what they've come to their senses concerning. And they're here. Do we show compassion? Again, we're going to be discussing that tonight. So notice, it says, But the father said to the servants, Bring quickly the best robe. Wait, so all the son had a chance to say was, I've sinned against heaven and before you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe. We know that he had a whole lot more to say. Remember, remember he said, I'm going to tell him, I'm, I'm not going to be uh, your son anymore. I'll just be a slave in your house. I'm no longer worthy. But the father didn't let him. He didn't allow him to speak any longer. He says, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Why did he not allow him? Because the father had nothing, wasn't thinking about the monologue that the son had. What was he thinking about? His third, in the third and final place, he was rejoicing. He's too busy rejoicing over his son returning that he couldn't hear the rest of the story. So the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe. 
So this would be the father's clothing. Can you imagine what he's wearing at this time? He puts on the best that he can give him. And put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Can you imagine how hungry he is? And his father is going to feed him. Notice, bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. But wait a second. I thought he'd already received the third of his inheritance. Remember, he, he, would, he was given his portion. So where did the fattened calf come from? It came from the two-thirds that was left over. It came from the father and the oldest son. This was a sacrifice for his son to be able to return. He didn't deserve anything. He could have said, wait a second, I'm forgetting. I've already given you everything. Yeah, see you later. That's not what he does. He shows respect for his willingness to repent, to change his life, to actually get up and come back. But I think it's important, remember, he also had the right under the law because he was rebellious. He was a drunkard. He had the right to take him before the council and him be killed. We need to remember that Jesus was that son that was killed because of rebellion. Because of the need for repentance and through the son that was killed by the father, we have rejoicing. We have an inheritance, which is the greatest resource that we can have in Christ. If you will, Ephesians chapter 2, and then the lesson will be yours. When you read Ephesians 2, 1 through 7, I want you to think about the prodigal son. And then I want you to think about yourself. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you, in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, and the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body, and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ." question for you this morning is, are you in Christ? Are you willing to get up from where you are and walk back to the Father? He's here and He'll throw His arms around you. Whatever your need is, won't you come? While together we stand and while we sing.